The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. subject um there's been a lot of literature published in this area i guess in the last five years and so i'll basically synthesize and try and make sense of some of this conflicting information all right so the plan of the talk is we'll just briefly make sure we're on the same page as exactly what we mean by post-operative vitellaria or post-operative cognitive dysfunction. There's a bit of different nomenclature around. Uh, we'll then think about what actual EEG patterns we are interested in, and then how the operative EEG patterns are linked with post-operative cognitive disturbances, uh, both with um, observational studies and with various randomized controlled trials. Um, if anyone's looking to answer an exam question on this sort of subject, <laughs> I don't know if the residents are here, um, I would recommend this article by Liz Everett and Peter Goldstein. You can see it's published in the International Journal of General Medicine, which is a kind of obscure journal for anesthesiology stuff to get into, I would have thought, but anyway. So what are we talking about when we're talking about post-operative delirium or, or some kind of disruption of your normal trajectory of neurocognitive recovery? Now, clearly delirium, we're talking about acute fluctuations and cognitive dysfunction, we're talking about much longer impairment of cognition. Uh, we can envisage it sort of graphically with this kind of figure where we have time on the horizontal axis and cognition, sort of a rough draft of cognition on the vertical axis. And you can imagine most people in general anesthesia, their cognition hopefully goes down quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> then talk about pachydelirium as some kind of impairment over the first few hours after the anesthetic, post-operative delirium occurring over days. And then for some people, there's a very slow or perhaps even permanent impairment in cognition over weeks or months or years. The question is, does it really matter? Well, post-operative delirium is associated with more death. Um, it's a bit unclear in many ways whether it's a marker or mediator of death. So you could imagine death might be caused by what was happening with the surgery and might be caused by delirium. And there's a question of does the surgery and the general anesthetic, etc., actually cause the delirium, which then causes death? Um, probably not. It's probably more of a marker. The first problem is that the actual measurement of post-operative delirium is not particularly good. Um, so if we say delirium is some kind of confused thinking or lack of attention to the environment, um, you'll see there's a whole lot of different scales to measure it. And there's not very good agreement with the different scales. Um, and these are all things which are going to basically introduce noise into any kind of studies that you're doing on this subject and will tend to bias everything towards the null. Um, <clears throat> I accept Latin for delirium as deliria for the plural. But my view is that, in fact, the whole problem is that our diagnosis of delirium is a bit problematic. And so I compare it with the diagnosis of fever or the diagnosis of cancer. Um, these are very general labels that are put on top of a wide range of different actual pathological processes. So the question is, can we predict who's going to get post-operative brain fever, we'll call it, 
and what are the causes. So you, you can imagine this is a very simple block diagram. The patient comes with a certain preoperative brain states. They are a robust brain or a fragile brain. They're exposed to general anesthesia and then also the pro-inflammatory processes of surgery, etc. To produce the intraoperative brain state. <clears throat> and we get a bit of a window of the intraoperative brain state by looking at the EEG pattern. So we can imagine that little EEG pattern block is the kind of the bit of the brain that we can see. We can imagine in the sort of yellowy green, the leaf green intraoperative brain state, there's quite a lot of stuff going on inside the brain that we can't see in the EEG. And then this results in the postoperative brain state. So it's just a, a general block sort of diagram of how we're going to think about this. The real problem <clears throat> of understanding brain fever is the underlying neuropathology. And so these are just some examples of recent studies actually trying to dig down into the real underlying neuropathology. And so you can see there's quite a lot of work by Rob Sanders and many others um, where by they've shown that post delirium is associated with various factors perhaps similar to what you might see in dementia, so the plasma tau will go increasing. There's an indication that basically the blood-brain barrier gets quite leaky and this seems to be associated with that sort of delirium. There's probably changes in expression of a whole lot of different factors, particularly inflammatory markers. Uh, so I'm not really going to go into details in this because I think it's very much an evolving field, but I just put it out there that if we're really going to understand uh, what's going on in our patients, we need to understand the nuts and bolts of the actual pathophysiology and the causes therein. But for the purposes of this talk, we need to consider how does the general anesthetic affect these sort of things? Because if we proposing the general anesthesia is actually contributing to the post-operative delirium, uh, we need to be able to link these, the general anesthetic effects to these pathological processes. So having said that, we'll look at the types of intraoperative EEG patterns. And essentially, I'm going to look at two. One is the power in the 10 hertz frequencies, alpha power. And in general, people with high alpha power are the sort of young and smart, beautiful people tend to have a high alpha power. So we think that alpha power is probably a good pattern to have. And <clears throat> burst suppression is the opposite. Um, it's probably a bad pattern to have. It's a pattern that's not seen physiologically. If you have burst suppression, you're either being poisoned with anesthesia or hyperglycemia or hypoxia or something. Um, and it's associated with periods of quiescence and then bursts of basically calcium bursts. So you're getting a lot of intracellular calcium going into your neurons, which is probably not so good for you. Um, so essentially we're saying, well, just to sort of summarize what we've got so far, <clears throat> that you need both the anesthetic drugs and some sort of pre-existing uh, vulnerability of the brain in order to get the post-operative delirium state. We are kind of hoping that the EEG captures the interaction for that particular patient. Um, <clears throat> and that when we give the anesthesia to produce this bad pattern, we've somehow changed the brain, set in motion various brain processes, so that the brain is not functioning very well, even though the anesthetic is drug that worn off. And essentially, we're looking for a post-drug effect. Anyway, the corollary really is if we can avoid this pattern or produce a good pattern, we will avoid this whole process. So that's the kind of null hypothesis that these studies are based on. Um, we have some caveats. And again, these are problems with measuring that will tend to reduce the power of any study we're going to do. And so there's a problems with measuring alpha power. So alpha power is at 10 hertz. I've shown a spectrogram on the top there that shows time on the horizontal axis and frequency on the vertical axis. <clears throat> 
And the power is a different color. So red is strong power and blue is weak power. And you can see there's a little peak that goes along about 10 hertz. It gets a bit slow when we give more volatile and gets a bit faster <coughs> when the volatile is wearing off. And you can either measure the total amount of power at the 10 hertz frequency mark. Uh, the problem is that's affected quite a lot by underlying EEG background 1 over F sort of power. You can measure the relative alpha power. Um, the problem is that's, you've got, that's including the other frequencies and the, the frequency of the most power is the delta power. So usually the relative alpha power is kind of paradoxically driven a bit inversely by the amount of delta power in the, in the process. And then you can just look at the oscillatory part of the alpha power, uh, <clears throat> which is probably the best measure of thalamocortical coherence. Um, there are problems with diagnosing even both suppression, which you think is quite a simple thing to diagnose, but this is a little study done a few years ago where they compared the burst suppression ratio as measured in the sed line monitor versus probably a more accurate visual estimation of birth suppression. And they found that <clears throat> essentially the said line missed a lot of birth suppression and that the visual analysis of the birth suppression correlated with um, post-operative delirium that the said line version didn't correlate. Um, so I think it's just issues about measurement of birth suppression. The other issue is that sometimes you see more birth suppression in posterior channels than in anterior channels. And clearly most um, intraoperative EEG monitors really just look at the anterior channels of the EEG. So there's, there's some issues in the measurement. The other problem is typically birth suppression, they'll just give you the percentage time that you're getting a flat line or some subthreshold EEG. And you can see these are two spectrograms of different patients, different birth suppression. And you can see that the bottom one has quite long periods of suppression. And the top line has very much shorter periods of suppression, um, <clears throat> but still quite a lot. And you can imagine that perhaps both of these different patterns would give you the same raw number of percent of this suppression ratio, which is the percentage of flat line. Um, <clears throat> so we'll start looking at observational studies um, <clears throat> and the relationship of alpha power to postoperative delirium. Um, <clears throat> we did a study some years ago looking at delirium and PACU, so that's a like very early post-operative delirium, and look to see what types of um, variables were associated with this. And um, <clears throat> we found a number of variables, but of interest, we found that if the patient didn't had no strong alpha power, particularly during the emergence of the anesthesia, or they had burst suppression during anesthesia, the chance of getting delirium were around about double. But we looked at a whole pile of univariate variables and made multivariate models. Um, the interesting thing was that when you made these various multivariate models, which is kind of what I talked a bit about yesterday afternoon, um, that inclusion of your EEG variables kind of dominated the multivariate model. So you, you had a certain model of I don't know, age, for instance, as one of the predictive variables of, of post-op delirium. But when you allowed the model to include EEG monitors, the age went away and the alpha power appeared. So it was basically blocking the effective age as a predictive variable. And since then, a number of studies have been done, which really kind of give the same sort of results, which I think is encouraging and things all pointing the same direction. And so as a general rule, if you've got a robust brain and you give that person propofol or sevoflurane, perhaps a bit less, um, it's an indicator that the brain is robust if it produces a decent alpha 
algorithm in response to the propofol. Um, obviously, it's a little bit sensitive dose, but essentially, you can think of the giving a brain some sort of GABAergic type of anesthetic is a sort of stress test for the brain to see how it's functioning. And so there have been studies that show that the amount of intraoperative alpha power is proportional to the preoperative neurocognitive function. So people have impaired function preoperatively produce less alpha power. Um, <clears throat> similarly, the alpha power during anesthesia will be related to the pre how poor the preoperative decline was. And also this is related to propofol requirements. So people who have basically preoperative dementia will need less propofol and will produce less alpha. Um, <clears throat> and they've suggested that the intraoperative alpha power is a better correlation with impairment than just your baseline pre you know, awake alpha power. And it's also related to post-operative delirium. Uh, slightly at an angle, this in fact has been used a bit in, um, in, in critical care. So patients who have some sort of brain injury in critical care, um, this group in Finland basically gave increasing um, pro concentration of propofol via infusion and showed in this fairly small study that um, patients who had a poor outcome, which are shown on the black dots, basically when you gave them propofol, they didn't get any EEG response. This was more slow waves than alpha waves, but it's the same idea that um, you should get an increase in slow waves when you, get, when you have um, propofol infusion. Uh, those that had a good outcome did, they are sort of light gray the light gray um, dots and they showed you higher concentrations of propofol. They produced slow waves and then subsequently they went on to have a good outcome. Um, the group in Massachusetts General have shown there's a link. So people who have low alpha power tend to have more burst suppression and so they've suggested this low alpha power, high or burst suppression at low anesthetic concentrations is a phenotype for a vulnerable brain. So that sort of moves us on to burst suppression. Is that related with delirium, brain fever? And <clears throat> there have been a, quite a few observational studies which suggest that burst suppression, intraoperative burst suppression, more or less doubles the amount of postoperative delirium you have. There have been a few studies that have shown opposite. So one study a little while ago reckoned that people who had burst suppression had less post-operative cognitive disturbance. This is more prolonged and they suggested that maybe it's protective. Obviously quite often in neurosurgery, you might actually induce um, <coughs> burst suppression as a way of reducing your brain metabolic demands and to protect your brain during a period of relative ischemia when you're clipping, got a temporary aneurysm clipping or something. So there is this uh, slightly unresolved issue about whether burst suppression is good or evil. Um, I think it depends a lot on the preoperative brain state and in young people, burst suppression is probably not particularly harmful. Um, Max Keltz's group did a study where they gave healthy volunteers a long period of quite high isofluorine anesthetic and found no cognitive disturbance afterwards in those that got burst suppression. <clears throat> so I was asked to put this up in the middle of the talk, I presume. <laughs> um, this is uh, people can text us and get their CME. Um, <clears throat> because we'll move on now to observational study methodologies. Um, this is a bit of a complicated diagram, but essentially we're looking to th think about how does EEG mediate 
where I stop at a delirium or brain fever. And it, you can see it's just a slightly expanded version of the previous block diagram that I did. So your preoperative brain state and the amount of anesthetic, the MAC and the type of surgery will interact to produce intraoperative brain state, which we get a bit of a window of by looking at the EG pattern. And then that gives you your postoperative uh, cognitive emergence trajectory. And you can imagine there's all sorts of other causes that might disturb your post postoperative brain state. Similarly, your preoperative brain state uh, will be related somewhat to your level of frailty and your age. And you can imagine that will be related to your cardiovascular responses. And I guess if you haven't got an EEG, uh, your cardiovascular responses will be quite important drivers in your decision as to how much anesthetic or what type of anesthetic you're going to give the patient. So that's why there's a little arrow loop going around between CVS and MAC and surgery. That's to indicate that in observational studies, and particularly those where you haven't access to an EEG pattern, uh, that that will probably be your primary driver of your anesthetic dosing. If you do have an EEG pattern, you can see there's a dashed blue line at the bottom, a little with an arrow, where you're saying basically the amount of general anesthetic you're giving the MAC will be driven to some, to some degree by the EEG pattern. So you can see there's quite a complex interaction of various causal effects there. And so really we're interested in is, does the EEG mediate um, <clears throat> the postoperative delirium, the brain fever. Um, uh, so essentially, we're just looking at those sort of causal pathways of does the MAC and surgery cause this postoperative delirium? Is it via the brain that we can't see, which is basically the dark blue arrow, or is it mediated via? some part of the brain that we have access to, i.e. we can see it related to the EEG pattern interoperatively, which is the sort of brown arrow. Uh, <clears throat> in relation to my previous talk, there are some confounding pathways, uh, which is those black dots. Um, <clears throat> and so there have been some, a couple of studies looking at whether the EEG mediates um, the effects of the preoperative brain fragility. So they, usually these were using the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, which is the MOCA. So we'll say, does the EEG mediate the brain frailty as measured by the MOCA? And this was a study a few months ago where they did a mediation analysis. Um, this was done on the Engages study, which I'll come on to a bit later on. Uh, which is a little bit problematic in that you were trying to fix the EEG and reduce the birth suppression in one group. So they looked at a subgroup who had preoperative uh, impaired mocker tests <coughs> to see how much the EEG contributed to the postoperative brain fever. And essentially, they found that the direct effect of the preoperative cognitive impairment on postoperative cognitive impairment was about 15%. And that amount that was mediated by the intraoperative EEG was only about 2%. So overall, the EEG and the preoperative brain fragility as measured by the MOCA contributed to about let's say a bit less than 20% of the total amount of postoperative delirium. And I think this is a figure that we need to bear in mind that, um, <clears throat> that the total contribution of the anesthesia to postoperative delirium is like about a fifth. So it's not a, not, it's not a majority. There are plenty of people that get delirium that perhaps didn't even have a general anesthetic, had a spinal anesthetic. And conversely, there are plenty of people that get birth suppression or lower alpha that don't get postoperative delirium. So the, the, the correlation is there, but it's not huge. Another um, 
model for looking at how delirium might be mediated by EEG was done by the, again, by the Massachusetts General Group. And they suggested, in fact, the birth suppression was a much stronger mediator of um, the overall outcome. They had a different study, study design. This was, in fact, was related to the use of dexmedetomidine. So it's sort of like an observational study. Anyway, the problem is that mediation analysis is quite problematic because um, the problem is the mediator is often is, it's confounded by various known and unknown confounders. And so there's a whole blizzard of literature about how to do mediation analysis, of which I sort of only understand half. And they talk about various natural control, direct and indirect effects and reference interactions. And you can see I've got a whole lot of terms that are used in the literature. Um, so I just put up a slide to say mediation analysis is <clears throat> um, not for the faint hearted. <laughs> and <laughs> it sounds like it'd be useful to telling you actually what's causing the problem, but um, it's a little bit tricky and needs to be taken with a pinch of salt often. So we'll sort of move on now to, can we actually do something useful to stop post-operative delirium? And there have been a few randomized trials. And so over the last, I guess, almost 10 years, there have been a number of trials. You can see it in the number of meta-analyses, two or three meta-analyses, typically using about five or six trials, about two and a half thousand patients. Um, <clears throat> most of these trials, they were comparing um, whether you looked at the EEG intraoperatively and saw whether using that to basically decrease the amount of volatile anesthetic you're giving the patient, whether you get less postoperative dysfunction. And you can see it seems to be quite effective, the use of the EEG uh, more or less reduce the post-operative delirium by about 40%. And you tended to give perhaps 10 or 20 or 30% less volatile um, <clears throat> if you dosing your volatile based on the um, EEG. So that is kind of suggested that it was quite a useful thing to do and you had quite a big effect on post-operative delirium. So, I mean, that would be like number needed to treat of two or three or something. Um, then the ENGAGES trial was done um, <clears throat> and this was quite a large trial. There was 1,200 patients and about a 25% post-operative delirium rate. They found there was no difference between the groups. So one group was e guided and one was just normal care and they found no difference in delirium insert rates after these anesthetics. Um, <clears throat> you can see there's still within this trial in both groups is a correlation between birth suppression and the amount of delirium. So in, this, the, in these um, graphs, you can see that those patients with delirium had more interruptive birth suppression. Um, <clears throat> you can see there's quite a lot, a certain number of people have a lot of birth suppression but don't have post sort of delirium. And that's what I've outlined in the yellow circles. Conversely, some have post sort of delirium but little birth suppression. Um, and then quite a lot really still had a lot of birth suppression, even though they were in the treatment group. So treatment group reduced the amount of birth suppression by 25 to 50%. Um, but you can see there was a little, still a lot of birth suppression, which I found interesting. Um, I mean, we've just recently done a trial looking at alpha power and delirium and essentially there's almost no birth suppression. So I think 
the incidence of birth suppression seems to vary widely between different practices around the world. I mean, here you can see quite a lot of, even in the EEG guided group, um, quite a lot had more than half an hour of birth suppression. It wasn't just a little bit of birth suppression during induction where you go with it too much propofol. Anyway, but the conclusions really were that um, <coughs> guiding, using the EEG guidance didn't decrease the delirium. Part of the problem also was they didn't really have a great decrease in the MAC, so they had about a 12% decrease in the MAC. So their decrease in MAC was quite a lot less than those studies that showed that they did, that EEG did reduce um, post-operative delirium. Um, so there was a, another updated meta-analysis published recently, which showed it was a lower risk ratio, but it crossed the magic number one. And so they felt there was no effects of using EEG to guide post-operative delirium. There was another study, the DAP2 study, where they looked at different levels of sed line, um, the patient state index. And again, found no difference in delirium, a bit less birth suppression, pretty much the same levels of MAC for both the treatment group and the control group. Um, there's problems though with these sort of studies um, because they don't really fulfill the randomized control trial terribly well. So this is a very interesting book by a chap called Bill Shipley, where he basically has thought about these things quite carefully. He says, you must be able to assign the values of the cause to the patients independent of any attributes of these patients. Now in these sort of studies, you can't really assign values of suppression to the, you can't switch on birth suppression in the patients that's in, in any way as independent of the brain frailty of the patients. So, to switch off the birth suppression, you've got to reduce your MAC. <clears throat> and this is your success in achieving birth suppression elimination will depend on the brain, the response of the brain of the patient that you're delivering the MAC to. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the actual assignment of the MAC you're giving is, is not direct effect on the patient that's mediated by the patient's inborn brain frailty. So like a nice simple randomized control trial, the diagram would be something like this where you've got a random, you choose to either have the active or the placebo and you get exposure to this pill and you have an outcome of life or death. That's kind of like what randomized trials were designed for. Uh, but we have this kind of problem where um, we're trying to randomize the EEG pattern, which is that red square, red outline square at the bottom. And we've got all these interacting things happening that are going to mess with our randomization. And so by, we hope by looking at the EEG, we're no longer being delivering the general anesthetic by cardiovascular responses, et cetera, analysis. Obviously that's, the reality is a little bit different from what you hope for, but that's what you're hoping for. You basically just randomize the patient to getting birth suppression or not. But the only way you achieve that is with that little feedback loop through the concentration of the anesthetic you're getting. So all this will tend to <clears throat> make the randomized trial be less powerful. So all these problems, you're introducing noise into your randomized trial and making it less powerful. Um, you can see there's also still a loop between the EG pattern and the post-operative state. That's why there's a correlation between the birth suppression and your post-operative delirium in all these studies. Um, <clears throat> And I'd point out that the studies which have a big difference in MAC concentration between the control group and the intervention group are the ones that show a big post-operative delirium difference. So I'm sort of getting to the end. <clears throat> um, 
we wrote an editorial in anesthesiology a couple of months ago um, because talking a bit about different mediators and markers and the analogy I used was in the myocardial infarction so you could use say signs of ventricular ectopics or ventricular fibrillation as an indicator of myocardial infarction so that you could say problem death in myocardial infarction is mediated through arrhythmias um, but whilst treating arrhythmias obviously has a role it's probably more accurate to say that the problems of myocardial infarction are mediated through ST changes, which are directly, which are direct markers of basically a coronary artery that's blocked. And so that's a much more direct mediator that's closely linked to, or a direct marker that's closely linked to the true mediator of myocardial infarction, which is a blocked coronary artery. So if we want to do an analogy with birth suppression and brain fever, we have to say, are the mechanisms of producing the birth suppression the same as those produced brain fever, post-operative delirium? And probably not particularly. Um, <clears throat> and we need to therefore broaden our therapeutic approach uh, because we know there are lots of things that will cause delirium that are not related to birth suppression. Obviously, centrally acting anticholinergic drugs, aminergic drugs, amnesic drugs, they all will tend to produce brain fever and probably don't really affect birth suppression much at all, let alone all these other pathological processes that I mentioned briefly before. So my conclusions really are that if you see a low alpha and the patient is easily getting into birth suppression intraoperatively, they fail the brain stress test. Now, <clears throat> Your responses are probably you might want to reduce the amount of volatile you give and that will reduce delirium a little bit, but probably not a huge amount. But perhaps more importantly, you should make other plans. So this is clearly a patient that is at high risk of post-operative problems. So you don't want to send them off to the wilds of the orthopedic wards or somewhere, I don't know what the American equivalent is, but uh, it's probably reasonable for that person to have some degree of higher post-operative care available to them to stop them going mad and jumping out of bed and pulling out their IVs, etc. And you don't see this if you have an EG up monitor on intraoperatively. Um, as I said before, reducing the MAC has got I would guess modest benefit, but not huge benefit, partly because of our measurement problems and partly because there are other things that are more important. And once we understand brain mechanisms, we'll know how to answer these questions properly. And I would end by saying that negative randomized control trials, um, I think you can, they're interesting, uh, but I think you have to just take some of the results with a bit of a pinch of salt in terms of whether you're going to change your own practice. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the many collaborators I've worked with over the years and my current funding, which is by the James X. McDonnell Foundation. Thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Jamie, that's fantastic stuff. It, it really is. It, it really kind of sets us um, away from our, our models and, and, and sort of should give us great pause when we, when we think about randomized control trials as a means to get it at uh, mm -hmm. the, the vast morass of stuff that's going on in the head. Uh, I ask in the, in the text, uh, not uncommonly, the elderly may have little or no alpha signal. Is this, is, is this absence of alpha a predictor of increased potential for delirium? Uh, yes, it is, um, <clears throat> and particularly the intraoperative alpha. I mean, people vary quite a bit in the preoperative when they're awake, there'll be a varying amounts of alpha, but um, really you should, once, if you've got a, I don't know, 0.6 MAC or something happening, <clears throat> 
you should be getting a reasonable amount of alpha. And if you're not, then uh, there's a much higher incidence of post-operative delirium. It'll be at least double, perhaps four times as much. Now, it, obviously it depends on your pre-existing probability. So, I mean, if you starting off, say, with a 25% chance of getting post-operative delirium and you don't have any alpha, it's pretty high. You're going to have, I don't know, probably 50-50 chance of getting post-operative delirium. <coughs> uh, so it's, as I say, it's probably worth making some sort of strategy afterward to minimize the harm of that in the patient. Uh, the trial we've been doing was to see whether you can actually increase the intraoperative alpha by messing around with your drug dosing. Uh, so that's the one I was just referring to, which has got this James McDonald Foundation grant. Um, and we haven't published that yet, but I think it's, it's quite difficult to increase the amount of alpha by messing around with your drug dosing. So essentially, you usually give a bit less volatile and a little bit more opioid. Um, <clears throat> and we, so we haven't really analyzed it properly yet, but my feeling is that our, temp, our ability to increase alpha intraoperatively is not very great. But essentially, the alpha the patient produces intraoperatively is a marker of their preoperative brain fragility. Um, there's a question in the, in the chat. Is there any known relationship between maintaining mean arterial pressure at pre-anesthetic levels and the incidence of birth suppression? We talk a lot about cerebral autoregulation being uncoupled with volatile anesthetics. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I'm not aware of... Um, uh, most of the studies on birth suppression go are at pains to say they gave extra metaraminol and the blood pressure was the same in the birth suppression patients as in the non-birth suppression patients. So th they've kind of looked at it backwards, uh, but I don't think people have done studies forwards where they've driven the blood pressure up a little bit and shown that you get less birth suppression. So I think it's an interesting question. Um, there doesn't seem to be a strong relationship. <clears throat> People seem to get birth suppression even though you keep the blood pressure reasonable, but I don't know, what's a reasonable blood pressure <laughs> for that particular patient? Um, it's another can of worms, that one. So there's a, there's a separate question. This I, this, I presume, has something to do with, uh, with New Zealand. Kia Ora. Congrats yeah. on America's Cup. Any difference between foreign sevoflurane um, versus uh, dose versus, I'm, I'm not sure what dose is, versus xenon versus Tiva? Yeah. Um, so I think xenon is uh, interesting in that it's supposed to be quite brain protective. Uh, but it's also quite a sort of aminergic kind of um, compound. Um, and so there have been some studies that in cardiac surgery where they found that xenon wasn't protective. They were kind of, from memory, they were modest sort of 200 patient studies. Uh, but I think that's an open question and we need you know, more wide use of xenon to be able to really answer it how protective it is um, versus TIVA, propofol TIVA versus volatiles. Um, <clears throat> again, there's some conflicting um, results. I mean, my feeling is that uh, volatile TIVA is a bit protective, but um, probably you need to uh, give pure propofol anesthetic uh, rather than a mixture. So I don't know if in America, but quite often people will give a TIVA and then a little bit of sevoflurane on top now and then when things get a bit sort of wobbly. Um, as part of this alpha max study, we gave propofol at the end, the way you sometimes do for children to reduce delirium. We gave 
infusion at the end and it didn't have any effect in the PACU delirium that we were measuring. So I think we all believe profile is better than volatile, but the actual studies are a bit equivocal in that respect. David McElroy asks, uh, Jamie, is it fair to say that you aren't holding your breath waiting for a delirium substudy results of the balanced trial? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, interesting. I mean, I gave quite a lot of balanced trial anesthetics back a few years back. Um, I think it's under it is I think it's under consideration for publication at the moment so I'm not sure how that will play out but I'm assuming that it'll get published in a few months time would be my guess um, without trying to uh, <laughs> mess with that process too much So at least I'm, I'm looking for kind of a take home here is, do you think, do you think that um, the idea that uh, birth suppression as uh, the folks at Harvard would suggest is, is somehow a, a mediator of, of delirium, but uh, the, the actual causal pathways are, are still pretty muddy? Yeah, I would say that. Um... Because there's lots of people that get delirium that don't have birth suppression. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, I mean, personally, I think it's a, it's more of a marker than a mediator. Um, but I think it is. Obviously, it's a sort of red light. So it's reasonable to reduce your anesthetic a bit if you're getting birth suppression, unless you're trying to do it on purpose. And I think if you find you're kind of getting birth suppression and you're on 0.4 MAC or something, <laughs> uh, I think you can anticipate a lot of problems. Um. <clears throat> well, we, we often, ref often find that it's remarkable how little anesthetic um, we find ourselves giving if you're actually monitoring um, frontal cortical information. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's it's. Uh, I'm walking into rooms all the time where you know the, there's a, a just a, a raft of blackness on the on the yeah. set line, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and it's amazing you know what happens when you start turning things down. I think that's as much as anything sort of a it it feels better to do to to you know create less birth suppression, yeah. but as you suggest, it it may not be a much more than a marker. It does tell us, I think that when we find ourselves turning the anesthetic way down that we probably are dealing with the fragile brain. Yeah, I think it's so definitely is telling you that. I personally think you can reduce, have a modest effect of reducing the problems by turning your anesthetic down in those situations. Uh, but I wouldn't say it's the be all and end all. But I, I think it's reasonable to well, I mean, when you're giving an anesthetic, there's a whole cloud of different phenomena that you're integrating to <laughs> produce the best dose for that particular patient. And I think this is one component to that cloud of um, cloud of information that you, you're trying to deal with. We've had the, the said line in the store since about August of last year. And uh, I think our experience is still growing substantially. Uh, I think we, you know, there's, a, there's an awful lot we yet have to learn. Uh, yeah. But um, I, I, I think simply, simply applying it and, and trying, to, trying to apprehend what it's telling us is, is certainly, certainly more than worth our time. Um, yeah. and, and certainly if, if, we, if we persist in this, we are very shortly going to be, be able to actually get uh, most of the numbers from the set line drawn into the record uh, yeah. electronically, which is going to give us the opportunity to, um, to actually do 
uh, something statistical with a with a relatively large volume of information. Yeah. So we're we're looking forward to that, and hopefully we will be able to be able to generate some work. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, well, that sounds excellent because um, the brain is a complicated thing. <laughs> Don't expect simple results. <laughs> No. Even the anesthetized brain. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Well, yeah. I keep poking around in my own just to, just to see what sort of slings and arrows I, I I suffered at the hands of the anesthetic and that I received here <laughs> relatively recently. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that I was terribly injured, but uh, I'm, mm. the jury's probably still out. <laughs> well, yeah. Again, that's a difficult thing to measure and seems to vary quite a lot. But I think, like Douglas Adams said, it's mostly harmless. For the most part. Yep, yep. Are there other questions? Let's see, got to jump off. Thanks, Dr. Slay. That was Warren Sandberg. Um, well, it's 724. Um, if there are other questions, I think, uh, I think Dr. Slay is, is going to provide us with his, uh, with his slides and, uh, um, yeah. folks will, uh, and, and the, this, this, uh, this session has been recorded and will be available for your review. There's a lot of information in this and certainly, uh, certainly, a, a, a wealth of, of, you know, things that are really not at all completed yet that, uh, that are still in process. So um, I encourage you all to continue following this literature. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating literature and I think it's something that um, is going to become more meaningful in our, in our conduct of anesthesia as time goes by. Um, Jamie, thank you again for, um, for agreeing to being tortured at, uh, at midnight on your end. <laughs> um, there are no other questions. I think we need to, we need to probably get on to work. Anybody else? So thank you from Letha.